All right. How are you, Mark? I'm good. How are you? Doing good. We appreciate you being here. Ha happy to be here yeah. with this. Yeah. With we this appreciate you being here. Uh, we watched your documentary that you were in. We thought it was funny. thought it was hilarious. We love watching you in it. And so we asked some questions, get to know you, get to know stuff of your opinion on Flat Earth, all that good stuff. But we really appreciate you being out here for us. So Happy to do it. Anytime I get a chance to talk to young people and make myself feel old is, is always a good thing. All right, cool. Yeah. So is there any questions you have for us before uh, we get started? Uh, no, other than I know that after this one, I don't have one until the end of the day for you. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. There's a quite a big break between this one and the next one. So Good. I will have lunch <laughs> after, between now and then. Right. Yeah, brought me more. All right, so we're going to start off with questions. We're going to start off with all the personal stuff. We're going to start off with all the personal stuff because we love to get to know you. We love... You know, get to know about you because we thought you're hilarious in the documentary. So we'll just start off with some personal stuff. But is sure. there anything you would like to talk about before I ask you any questions? Uh, no, nope. Let's just get to the personal stuff, and hopefully, I won't ramble too much. All right. All right. So let's see. Uh, personal. I'm just gonna skip around the personal. Remember, you don't have to write your responses down for this one. Okay. You can just listen to the part. So let's skip around. Let's just start with where do you live? All that basic stuff. Uh, I currently live on a little island in the northwest corner of the United States, just north of Seattle. In fact, I can, if I drive up the road, maybe three miles from here, I can see Canada. There, it's an it's an island. That, in fact, I used to, I I lived in Canada for a a year, uh, which I actually call Canada. I'm trying to bring that back because let's bear with me. Ready? So mm -hmm. Americans live in America, right? Canadians uh -huh. live in Canada. Yeah, okay. this Canada thing, yeah, it doesn't work. Not, not right. doing it. So let's see. Uh, what was it like being in the documentary, your experiences, all that good stuff? Tell us about all the stuff in the documentary. It was fun. It's different from, from doing podcasts and everything else like that. I mean, a uh, Los Angeles film team contacted me back in uh, 2017. I believed and and said, "Hey, can we can we fly up to Seattle and you know hang out with you and you know kind of do an informal screen test?" And in fact, the opening scene, which is funny, the opening scene of of the movie where we're on that beach and I'm kind of saying what the world is. That was the first thing we ever shot. We just went down there and in documentaries, by the way, just so you know, uh, most of the time you don't do multiple takes. You just go and then it you know it's all in the editing. You find whatever you need in the editing. So we shot off and on for seven months. Uh, spent time with them with the Eclipse out in Oregon and then down in Raleigh and then did a couple film festivals. Uh, I was there at the premiere and on at the Toronto Film Festival. But it was fun. Good, good group of people. Um, they, they, they weren't flat earthers, which actually helped. You know, they they didn't like flat earth as a topic. This was a side thing for them. They honestly, if you guys didn't know, 99 percent of most movies out there, you'll never, ever see in your life. They just don't make the cut. So uh, they had no faith. Like, for example, real, real quick, um, the Toronto Film Festival, there were 3000 movies submitted. They can only pick 100. And out of those, maybe 10 get noticed. And we got into every film festival that we applied to. So good for them. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So let's see about the documentary. Let's see. Tell us about Patricia Steer and your relationship with her and all that Thanks. good stuff. Uh, Patricia Steer and I uh, had a relationship before the documentary ever filmed, but as the old Mark Twain saying goes, uh, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So, and, and or more aptly, uh, the late Carrie Fisher, you know, Princess Leia from Star Wars, she said, if it's on television, it's not real. So you change what you need to for the narrative. News tends to do it from time to time, you know, you you, you always want to maximize the the story. So Patricia and I had a relationship before the thing started and but we we shot some scenes during the documentary and kind of made it seem like we were still kind of doing a thing and we weren't. We we had kind of wrapped up our thing and she tried to marry a guy off in um England. In fact, they they showed that during the documentary. And then uh they they broke up and she's back in Houston. She didn't go to the last conference in Vegas, but we see her in chat rooms from time to time. Okay. She's she's yeah. wonderful, by the way. Patricia Steer is the an absolute absolute yeah, gem. The documentary, you know what a simp is, Mark? 
And yes, synth. I I had yes, I do know what a synth is. I was probably called a synth a, a number of times. Yeah, we we laughed hard when they when she was saying we are a couple, and then a couple of friends. That made yeah, us laugh yeah, hard. yeah. That oh, oh they, you got friend zone, Mark. Oh my God, I didn't even know what a friend zone thing was. And I, I'll be honest, I mean, yeah, she was at least an octave above me, above my station. She's up in. She's even better in real life than she is uh, on on video. In fact, she was the only person that you know because we did a bunch of screen tests together and the producers just laughed it's like it's like yeah why why even bother giving her a screen test we know she's camera ready i yeah. mean she she had not i'm not gonna pick her makeup box i've seen deep sea tackle boxes less equipped than what she would bring to the hotel rooms it was hilarious you know mm -hmm. she you know where where she'd open up the box and go kung, 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 you know layers of stuff but she was she could have been a professional makeup artist in in real life so what about your mom? How's she doing? We all loved your mom. We thought she was really um, sweet and supportive. And then she never, is she around Earth or what is she also? Oh, no, no. She's flat. She's flat. Every time uh, somebody sends me a flat Earth shirt. And by the way, thank you for wearing an I am Mark Sargent shirt. Really, yeah, really of appreciate course. That. I got to support you. Thank you. Uh, she, Even though I don't get a dime for it. Uh, any, any flat Earth shirt I get that I get sent from conferences and, and meetups and stuff, uh, I give to her and she wears them. So it's awesome. I, I love her. She's still around, and uh, she'll be turning eighty-one here pretty soon. And uh, I'm I'm grateful that that she is still with us. Well, that's good. Yeah, because she, she was uh she was very supportive. It seemed yeah. like she was just like just I want the truth to come out, not necessarily on either side. At least from the documentary spin point yeah. of it. But... Yeah, and and again, you know, she had to sign the the release form to get into the documentary. Mm -hmm. And like like everybody else, uh, the one guy that that I really wanted to get in the documentary was my brother in law, and because uh, he's also a pilot, and he 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 would have been great, real down home, you know, country country guy, could have mm -hmm. would have would have been a great Texas guy, and but again, he was married to my sister, and my sister who was a cheerleader growing up, she's all about public awareness and she she told me she goes, don't you dare sign anything, you are not going to be in that documentary. As I felt bad. Cause she, he, I think he would have been great, but I'm glad, I'm glad mom got it. Okay. Uh, let's see what other questions I can think of. Uh, well then what about current relationships? Are you looking for a relationship since old Patricia Steer didn't work out <laughs> on those flatter dating sites? I wasn't even looking, you know, for Patricia Steer, you know, she, she reached out to me after I did a podcast on my, uh, my top 50 favorite, uh, dystopian movies you know, disaster movies. And she said that she owned like 48 of them, owned them. I'm going, wow, that's pretty amazing. And, uh, and then we, we you know, we kind of connected that way. Now, I mean, it, I kind of treat it like a, you know, I'll use uh, something from your neck of the woods, like a country square dance, you know, where you change partners. They, they don't do that. I don't think. Do we well, do that? you guys, you guys know what square dances are. Yes, we know. Yeah. Yeah. We you know. know, you spin your partner round and round and do -si do and, and all of a sudden you're with a new partner and that's how I kind of treat life. You know, whatever comes around great. Uh, most of the time I'm not looking. If I ever live, if I live long enough to write an autobiography, it's going to be literally called unsolicited because I mean, all the stuff that happened to me, including the documentary, including the endorsements, including everything else, I never even had to pick up the phone. People just called me and the uh, same thing happened with relationships, Patricia and, and other flat earth girls. I will say this though. I will only date, a uh a flat earth woman going forward it, it's, it's, it's the round earth women are crazy or something well no it's just too much of a it's too much of a paradigm change you know i've i've, I've i know other flat earth people and it is it's too the the thought process is too different you know it's, it, you might as well be be t be two different religions in fact religion two di two different religions would be easier than doing a, a globe earth flat earth scenario so okay yeah uh, let's see what other questions, personal questions that we have on here. Hmm. How was your childhood like growing up? What you do? Did you? Or, oh, 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 and I announced. We need senior boy for the last name R through F to the pack at this time for senior picture. Senior boys R through F. We'll scratch that. I'll oh crap! It. I I gotta I gotta go. <laughs> senior pictures. Um. Uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, they scratch that. Let's do 
Uh, what question do I want to do? Is this your full-time job, Flat Earth? Like, do you make good income enough to support yourself doing this career? I I certainly did before the pandemic. I, I will say that uh, everything was like, up, up until really March 2020, everything was was going swimmingly. I'll, I'll give you a quick story, uh, for example. Really, it comes down to, I mean, yeah, the, the books pay a little bit. I mean, not that many people buy books anymore. And the podcasts do okay, depending on where you are. But it really comes down to endorsements. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick one. I was slated to go back to, I'd done a talk show in London and I was going to go back for a McDonald's commercial in, uh, in 2020 and everything was set up ready to go. Cause they have pancake day over there and they thought, Oh, it'd be great. Cause it's flat and it's round. We'll put the flat earth logo on top. It'll be awesome. And again, passports are ready to go. In fact, they even, you know, we're, we're paying for a friend to come over. So I invited somebody to, to come with me. And then all of a sudden I, I get this email. It's like, yeah, it's just, you know, the borders are closed <laughs> because of uh, everything that was going on. It's like, ah, crap. So most of the time, yeah, it, it does. It does pretty well for me. But I'm again, I'm lucky. You know, a lot of people, it's it comes down to, you know, Patreon and subs and hits and stuff like that. Well, what'd you do before Flat Earth? What was your job like? What oh, was I, I was um, a department head for tech support team uh i had done nothing but software and tech support for years in fact i started out uh real quick uh i started out playing video games for a living believe it or not uh, i was hired by a company out in boulder colorado and that's how i got out there and spent 20 years doing my thing uh playing going out to conferences like mac world uh boston mac world san fran e3 and stuff like that playing mm -hmm. video games i was a ringer I was, I was really good at video games and then transitioned over to proprietary software and i taught proprietary software uh, around the country for the better part of 20 years. So I, I worked for my, notably time and attendance companies, which mm. is uh, time clock software. So I would go out to the middle of freaking nowhere and teach people in a blue collar factory how to run time clock software. And so I, I got I got to it was really fun because I got to see all the places in the United States you'd never, ever go to on vacation. I would go, you know, Blytheville, Arkansas or Dixon, Illinois or and then, you know, you fly out to an airport, then a smaller airport, then take a rental car for 40 minutes. And then finally you get to wherever you were going. So that's what I did. Hmm. Uh, let's see what um, I know you didn't tell this story to my last period class, but what? about how you're the world pinball champion or what is it? <laughs> at what point time? Yeah. Oh, man, I've had a weird life. Uh, the, um, in fact, if, if chapter one of the book, if if again, if I ever write it, chapter one will be called "Luck and Clever," because I was I just got so lucky. Um, yeah. So during when I was on probation for manufacturing explosives without a license from uh, where I was thrown out of university in my junior year, and not making that up, uh, I played a computer pinball tournament. It was one of the first video game tournaments in the world. Uh, it was uh, called. It was from a little company out of Japan called Little Wing. And the distributor happened to be out of Boulder, Colorado. And I figured out a way, I'll tell you guys, I figured out a way to not cheat, but I didn't, it would, but the tournament lasted an entire year. and I didn't want to play pinball for an entire year. Uh, so I found a way to mess with the algorithm so that I could keep scores because you can only send in one score a month. And so I could, I kept scores. I basically, I finished the tournament six months beforehand and never told anybody. And uh, yeah, but I became the, the best computer pinball player in the world and they hired me. Part of my part of my prize was to beta test one of their games. Not much of a prize, in my opinion. And uh, I gave it a scathing review. I said, look, because I, I was a very good normal pinball player. And I said, no, this is what you went did wrong. This, 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 this. And the guy from Japan, uh, the lead developer said, yeah, you should probably hire this guy. And they did. And so I flew out to Colorado. I'd never been there before in my life. And... Yeah, I still got the trophy I'm sitting sitting around. Surprise, never broke after all these years. So yeah, that and just to let you guys know how how old I am, that tournament I won it in '94. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, a few years ago. Uh, tell us about the college story since you got them hooked on it. Uh, sure. I uh, I made fireworks for. <laughs> all right, so I I live on an island where Fourth of July is a big deal because it's really wet. And so 4th of July, you don't have to worry about fires or anything. There's no burn bans most of the time. And I figured out I was pretty good at chemistry. And I was real. I, once once you realized how much money you were spending at the reservations for fireworks, I realized I could manufacture some of this stuff 
cheaper than what I was buying it for. And especially when the reservations contacted me and said, yeah, we'll, we'll pay, we'll buy everything you got. And all of a sudden it's like, wait, I can make money doing this. So I, m- me and about 30, 32, 33 of my friends, maybe 34, uh, on campus, uh, uh, up, up at Western, we manufactured this stuff and I was the, the big ringleader. And so when it all went down, when the thing, again, don't do illegal things, guys, don't ever do it. Uh, when it da- went down, uh, the ATF shut it all down and uh, I was one of the few people that got punished. And so, but in the end, I mean, it worked out, you know, cause I got to, uh, you know, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have done the pinball tournament, the pinball tournament. I wouldn't have gone to Colorado. Wouldn't have gotten into flat earth. Wouldn't be talking to you fine people right now. All right, cool. Yeah. So let's see any questions I want to talk about. Uh, what are your hobbies other than doing flat earth stuff? Uh, when I was younger, I was a big basketball fan. Uh, also, I windsurfed, loved hiking when I was in Colorado, uh, loved watching movies. I absorbed just about everything that's media. Uh, love, love sitting down with a, with a bowl of popcorn and a glass of something and, and watching movies or, or some decent TV series. Um, I don't know. Other than that, the normal hobbies. Oh, and video games, of course, life, lifelong gamer, but I don't know. There hasn't been something good that I've liked in a while other than, uh, Diablo resurrected, but. What? What? What's the question? This one? Wait. No. This one, this one, that one. What prominent places? What? Are you Tell, someone's asked me to ask you a specific question. What? What is it? Oh, never mind. Oh, come on! Don't be shy. Yeah, you, you basically already answered it. Oh. We basically already answered it. Yes, We're gonna get to that one of the last part. Uh, let's see. Any other personal questions that we can think of? Mm. Well, do you believe in any other? That's a good one. And do you believe in any other conspiracy theories or? Yeah, all whatever? of them. Now, most of them, I I can't talk about uh, for various reasons, you know, school wise. But I've looked into look at because I never got married or had kids. I had if you if you get if you never get married or have kids, you have huge amounts of free time on your hands. You just don't know it yet. And so, and then I was there when the internet was really young. And so I got into just about every conspiracy you could think of. And by that, I mean, I looked at them. I don't believe in every conspiracy. Some I like, some I don't like. Uh, But it really, for me, it comes down to, if I believe in a conspiracy, I look at it from the villain's point of view. So I look at it and I say, okay, this seems like a conspiracy. Why would they do it? And if I can't improve on the plot, because I consider myself a decent writer, if I can't improve on the plot, if I say, oh, yeah, that's exactly what I would do, then, yeah, it's probably a real conspiracy. It's probably got some truth to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but yeah. So do I believe that that, you know, I'll just throw out some generic ones for you. Do I believe that the, the moon landing was faked? Yeah. For various reasons. Do I think that Elvis had Bigfoot's baby? Probably not. Probably not. However, because I'm a flat earth guy, I'm not going to completely discount everything. So some no matter what conspiracy it is somebody comes at me with if they email me it's like yeah i'll give you a few minutes sure what do you got what what excuse do i have any uh, anymore you know i believe in i believe in flat earth i believe in i believe in this thing yeah so. oh well that's i guess personal question then we'll go into the flat earth stuff this sure. one's about the documentary yeah uh well i guess the last two when you're at nasa and yeah. that little thing and you're saying oh this thing doesn't work it's a bunch of crap and then right. they send in on the you know, press here button. Right. Uh, was that true or what? Oh, no, that was absolutely not true. And in fact, the the director, I remember, well, very specifically, because I was one of the first people to watch it uh, outside of the film team. And we and they let Patricia and I screen it privately at the hotel uh, when before the, the premiere. And they asked me if it, if it was OK if we left that part in. That's the power of editing. I want to tell you that right now, which is. You can omit things in editing if you've ever done it. You can chop things out and change the the complete narrative of whatever you're doing. So I walked up the you know the the that particular space center was old. It was like an old amusement park, right? It was old tech. Nothing worked. And so when I sat down in this chair, of course, there's only one giant button, right? One big green button, on, and of course you cannot miss it. It's designed for a freaking four year old. 
And what you don't know is the film guys were shooting us. And what they do is they wait for you to leave. So they have a buffer. So they know where to edit. So they were walking. So I, I left the scene and they happened to be focused on the green button. And then somebody said, what if we take out the part where Mark ever hit the green button, right? Where he was just trying to do touch screen and crap like that. We'll make, we'll make Mark look like he missed the most obvious thing. It's, it was a good gag. I, I agree, but it was completely, it was completely done on accident. They found it. What it's known is it's called find in the editing. So they found that moment. It's like, yeah, let's do this as a, as kind of a funny bit. And I look, I sat in on test audiences in, in different theaters and so I, it worked. It absolutely worked. People were like, Oh, look, Mark missed the green button. It's like, I mean, I could have shut it down, but I had to admit it was a, a good little, good little sting. So, well, that's one more personal. I know you're talking about the power of editing and all of that. Yeah. The the documentary made it seem like you lived with mom. Is that true? Yes. You did live yeah. with mom at the time of recording. Yep. Yes, I absolutely did. Uh, I what did. What had happened was I was in Colorado for 20 years doing my own thing. Um, mom never got remarried. And, you know, she was getting up there. And if you don't know anything, you guys will figure it out down the road. Uh, if, if one or both of your parents don't remarry, usually the, the mother, somebody's got to come back and kind of, you know, make sure that things are fine. Um, Patricia, one of her biggest regrets was uh, none. Of, she had two two uh, siblings. None of them, when her mother divorced, none of them, you know, came back to, you know, keep an eye on her. And, uh, you know, they, they found her later, you know, and, and she had been she had passed away days earlier and, and nobody knew. So now, you know, mom and I get along great and uh, I do not regret a single moment uh, with with my mother. And so, look, I, I've done my own thing. So I no no worries there. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll start asking the flat earth questions part. So sure. this is where you can start writing down. It doesn't have to be word for word. It's free. It doesn't have to be word for word. This will be on the test, guys. Yes. No, it'll, be test. it'll make up I'll most of your tomorrow. grade. Your oh, entire yeah. future depends on this. All right, so first one. If you went to space or were offered to go to space, would you? I know I've asked this question, but a lot of them are ones. Would you go to space if you're offered? And then if you saw the Earth was round, how would you react to that? If I was offered a chance to go to space, yes, I would go. It's simple as that. Yes, of course I would. In fact, there have been producers over the years that have tried to make this happen and they can't. Uh, because they're never going to let me go to space because there is no space to go to. I would have to sign the waivers and I wouldn't sign the waivers. And even if I did sign the waivers, I'd probably break them, which means I'd be removed. Um, if, I, however, if I went, if, you know, if space was real and they actually put me in a rocket, you know, and Elon Musk went with me, which kind of funny, he's never gone. Uh, and I saw the earth as a globe. Uh, what would I do? I'd quit. <laughs> I'd absolutely quit. I'd be like, yep, that's it. In fact, if you wanted to kill Flat Earth as a media subject, you know, if you wanted the silver bullet, that's what you would do. I am surprised that uh, myself or anybody else in the Flat Earth community has not been taken up because that would be the easiest way to do it. Uh, if, and if you didn't want to spend that money, you, you know, if you also wanted to get me to quit, put a put a 4K camera on the side of a rocket, point it down at the ground and shoot that thing out of orbit and show me uh, the, the Earth turning into a globe. It's never happened in the history of um photography when, when it comes to that it's never ever happened we've seen oh no we've seen the globe from from this side and this side we've never seen it in live action it's it's always been in in the editing so whatever okay. all right we'll do that now. so next question are there well i'm gonna kind of extend it but the main question is do you think other planets or other things are or are other planets real i guess i'm saying in the first right. place uh, all no, all the other planets that you see up in the sky are just lights on the ceiling. That that's all it is. You are looking when you're looking up and you see the stars and the moon and sun. You are just looking inside the the biggest structure ever built. It's something that, by the way, that was not built by us. Uh, that's a common question I get, which is like, well, you know, we we didn't have the engineering capability to build this. Like, no, we didn't. Absolutely not. Uh, it's, this is far far beyond us. So, uh, yeah, everything on the, 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 the planets that you see there, I'll, again, again I'll, I'll give a planetarian reference, which is when you go to a planetarium, do you see yeah. Jupiter? Do you see Jupiter up in the ceiling? Yes, you do. Can you land on it? No, 
but it looks spherical. It looks like you can land on. It's like, yeah, there's things on your television that you look like you can reach through. I know you guys aren't aren't old enough to remember, but when HD technology came out, you know, for, for televisions, people were just blown away because how of how realistic it was. Old old school televisions were just paled in comparison. Mm. So anyway, yeah, you're just living inside a giant building. Everything is right. uh, just lights on the ceiling. All right. Next question. What does the government have to gain? Or anyone have to gain from hiding this information. The short, you're... the short answer wow. is the short answer is power. Uh, you know, men. There's an old quote which is, "Men almost never give up power voluntarily." And by that, information is power, and information is the most powerful currency there is. So, what? It's not what they stand to gain; it's what they stand to lose. That's the that's also a short answer that should be on the test. It's not what you stand to gain. It's what you stand to lose sometimes. So if you don't we didn't even figure this place out until for sure until about 1960. And when you found out in 1960, well, civilization was already built. The infrastructure is already set in place. The concrete had hardened. You don't want to change that. You don't want to mess everything up. So you just keep it a secret. You know, you, you find out it's again, we didn't build it. We just kept the secret. It's like, okay, we're just, you know, we, we, you find that there's an old far side cartoon from years ago where the astronauts are, are off in orbit and they look at the, they look at the earth and it turns out the earth is this giant balloon with a string on the bottom of it. And one of them says the other, it's like, yeah, we should probably not tell anybody about this. Cause why would you, I, I've asked journalists a, a number of times, if you found out the earth was some sort of snow globe, if you found out it was some sort of structure like this, right. Would you tell the public? Well, your first instinct would be to tell the public, yeah, the people have a right to know. But then you think about it some more and say, like, well, we don't know how they react. So anyway, there you go. Uh, what's underneath flat earth, if there is anything underneath flat earth? Tapioca pudding. That's huh? what that's what's underneath. No, I do not put that down. Do not write that down. That is not a serious answer. The uh, what we don't know what's underneath flat earth because science doesn't know what's underneath what you think is earth. Meaning, oh, yeah. if you guys have seen the cross sections, and I'm sure there's a probably in fact, is there a globe in your classroom right now? A globe? No. Oh, that's too bad. You're lucky. So it's supposedly it's 4000 miles down to the center of the earth, supposedly. Right. And there's these bands you've seen all seen the cross sections, red and orange and yellow and white. They're about a thousand miles thick for whatever reason. They're perfectly uniform. And it's like, oh, wow, how do they know this? What's the deepest hole ever drilled? Is it 4,000 miles? Is it two? Is it one? Is it 100 miles? Is it 10? No, the deepest hole ever drilled is, is um, 7.8 miles, 12 kilometers, give or take. And the Russians and the Germans both did it separately in different locations, and they couldn't get through it. They couldn't even hit eight miles. For whatever reason, the drill bits just stopped working. And we don't know why. And we and, and so when anyone says, oh, yeah, what's what's underneath letter? You tell me what's underneath globe. You can't I tell me why you show me a cross section of the uh, the earth that shows every strata going down. And not only that, not only do, do people show us the what's the cross section of Earth, they'll show us the cross sections of all the other planets. Like you haven't even done anything on those. How are you showing me what the cross section of Saturn is? Give me a break. <laughs> so next question. Well, it's like a two-parter, but do you believe in the dome? Like, or is like, you know, your flat earth model, some people think there's not a dome. Is it dome? Right. Is right. there a dome? And then how does the dome essentially work? Right. So the, the, the question is for some people, you know, like three quarters of the people, we'll just go three quarters. Three quarters of, of our of our groups believe in some sort of dome structure like this, kind of like a snow globe, only more wider and flat. So I personally believe in the dome because I believe in uh, thermal dynamics and how air pressure works, meaning uh, something has to keep the air in. It's called air pressure for a reason. And the, the biggest question there, and you can look this up if you ever take physics, which is how does air pressure, our atmosphere, what you're breathing in right now, how does that sit next to the vacuum of space without being ripped off by space, just being shredded by space. And you say, well, it's gravity. It's, it's the only answer you can be. If it wasn't gravity, we'd be dead. Well, unless you were in some sort of pressurized system. And the whole term, it always bugged me when I was, when I was a kid anyway, that whole term greenhouse gases. And doesn't that make more sense if it's an actual greenhouse? You know, it's like, oh, you know, the the fluoro, you know, the, the fluorocarbons and everything get up to a certain point and they just stay there. It's like, really? They stay there at the bleeding edge of space next to a vacuum? Never happens. 
show me an experiment on the ground where you can where you can reproduce that you can so yes i be i believe it and by the way real quick the only people the the quarter of our group that don't believe in uh the dome they're just people again i'm not going to criticize them too much there's people that just don't like to be fenced in you know they don't like you know the confinement it's like oh you're being all captain bring down and crap it's like all right i, I get you but the dome is the only thing that makes sense okay uh next question has anyone been around the ice wall how does it function what is it all that right. stuff yeah, the the mythical ice wall. Uh, it, it's funny because the media latches onto it because they match latch onto simple terms. Uh, the ice wall is just the coastline of of Antarctica. The Anta the coastline of Antarctica, which you can look up all day on on any platform, is not the edge of the Earth. That is just the beginning of the edge of the Earth. So Antarctica, which is on all sides, all around us, uh, would be thousands of miles thick on on any point. Which is why it took them thirty years to freaking find it. You remember they were looking from. 1927 up all the way up until Operation Deep Freeze, which was oper uh, 1955, 56, looking for for the edge. So the so the if again, if you're looking at this, now you probably can't see it very well, but the the white part, you know, the edge of that, that would be the eye of the ice wall, the coastline of Antarctica. And again, the coastline of Antarctica is pretty imposing. It's kind of like Game of Thrones. You know, it's a 100, 150 foot wall of ice straight from the oceans, you know, straight up. But then you go inland. You'd have to go inland uh, a long ways before you hit whatever the outer marker is. What's at the outer marker? We don't know. That's classified. Okay. Uh, explain how what a shooting star is. How does it work? What is it in sure. the flat model? Two things. Um, one, most shooting stars, again, are just lights on a ceiling. Uh, you can do shooting stars all day long in a, in a planetarium. Now, do things hit the ground? Possibly... Okay, and that's it. See, I, I already missed it because I was S. So that's sad. I'm not going to get a picture this year. So anyway, uh, shooting stars for the most part are just lights, you know, lights on the ceiling. What I think is more interesting is that the lack of video, and you guys can look for it if you want, Remember, there's six, what, six billion smartphones in the world right now? That's a lot of cameras. And there is no video, as far as I can tell, that follows a shooting star or any meteorite from sky to ground. Really, really weird. The closest we ever got was, uh, if you remember, I don't know how many years ago it was, um, five, seven years ago, the that Russian one. They got close to some city in Russia that detonated over the city. I've again yet to see and you would think there'd be like water shots and stuff like that fishing boats people you know could see it some would come in fast when some would come in slow but for the most part they're just lights um but the physical objects if there was physical objects that'd be easy enough to do use railgun technology a uh, piece of metal ore fire it in a shallow angle try not to aim at cities piece of cake as, as a friend told me once yeah it's like throwing a little pebble into an aquarium physical but it works okay how do, I guess it would be, how do eclipses work with flat Earth? Got eclipses, it. Solar eclipses and all that good stuff. Uh, solar eclipses and lunar eclipses, for that matter. Uh, again, no different than a planetarium. So when you go into a planetarium, the, the moon phases can are just done artificially. So when you see a waxing and waning crescent and all the phases of the moon in a planetarium, it's not like you're you're putting anything in front of the light source that's block, you know, that's going on the moon. You're just eclipsing the moon or or shading the moon. Or if you want to turn blood red. Also, by the way, to your question, I didn't say this to the last class, but this this is something that always bugged me, which is so if the the moon, for example, you know, when the moon's in front of the sun, right? It generates that blackout zone. It's only 70 miles wide on the ground, right? But the moon is supposedly 2,000 miles wide. Well, if the earth is 8,000 miles wide, shouldn't it be casting an eyeball shadow on the moon about 250 miles wide, which would be easily visible from earth? Why wouldn't the, the moon turn into a giant eyeball? No one's talk about it. it's like, well, you use the same optics. I mean, it's the same, same freaking two bodies. Why, why wouldn't that ever happen? No one wants to talk about it, but whatever. Okay. Um, well, we got about five minutes till I'm kicked out. So, uh, let's do, I think we got two more questions. Maybe we can actually, we already answered one of them. Okay. One more question then. Sure. Do you, or do people think Earth is another shape other than round or flat or whatever? Yeah, 
Yeah, oh, I mean, there's there's two schools of thought here. One is that that you know we're living in some sort of self-contained you know thing like this, some big snow globe sitting on on desk. But the other shape that people like to think is like, well, maybe we're on a just a much much bigger Earth, a super Earth, and we're just a flat you know a flat world in a pond sitting on that Earth, and there's a whole bunch of other ponds and uh, other domes around us. And that we're just on on the a much much bigger structure, which of course is possible. That doesn't really help in the way of space. I like to say that you know if you want to know the shape of Earth, we could be just you know this sitting on a somebody's lab table, a giant lab table in the middle of something. By the way, we're not a one off, not by a long shot. You know, if you were if you had the technology to build one of these, you're going to build a whole bunch. Okay. All right. Well, that was the last question, Mark. We thank you for taking the time out of your day to, you know, be here with us. Happy to do it. A lot. You're amazing. Awesome. Uh, it's, it's always nice to talk to you, Jonathan. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, we're on that friend basis. <laughs> we, we, you can't call me that, though. Mr. Oh, that's right. I'm not so, am I, I'm supposed to call you. Yeah, but... yeah. It's, you uh, gotta, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. By my first name. They'll start oh. calling me by my first name oh, now. Oh, crap. I'm, you know, I completely forgot about that. It's Mr. Holland. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr. Holland, that's right. Yeah. It just sounds All so right. formal. It is. So I will see you, I guess at your time, it'll be like 1230-ish, your yep. time. Yep. I will I will All be right. ready. So thank you, thank you, guys. Thank you, and, uh, right now. Godspeed. Yeah. God bless. Yes. Bye, Mark. Be good. Perfect. All right. All right, thank you for joining us, Mark. Hi, guys. Hi. What's up? So thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come talk with us. And, well, you know, you know I'm, I'm very busy. Questions. Yeah. <laughs> so we appreciate it. We appreciate it. Like, yeah, happy to do it. Documentary. Uh, we loved it. We loved uh, you and the documentary. That was hilarious. So we wanted to interview you and get your thoughts on Flat Earth and about you. Sure, sure. Happy to do it. And if I'm not mistaken, this is my last class for the day. Yes, this is the last class of oh, the day. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So before we get started, is there anything you'd like to ask us? Um no. No, I thought all yeah. your questions, the the first two classes did really great. Uh if you guys don't, you know, live up to their expectations, I'm sure you'll all be taking another year at this school. Just so you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Everything right, your entire so, most of your grade rides on this right now. Yeah. This right here. Yeah. All right. So we'll start off with the personal questions because we love getting to know you. Okay. So let's see. Let's just start off with a simple one. What sure. was it like being in the documentary? What made you do it? How was it? All that good stuff. Uh it, it just can't again. It if I had to write an autobiography, it'd be called Unsolicited. So uh, an L.A. film team contacted me back in 2017 and they said, hey, how would you We want to do a side project? We don't know if it's going to go anywhere. Can we fly up and, and talk to you and do a screen test? It's like, sure, why not? And they came up and we we had pizza and they said, you know what, let's just start shooting right now. And so we went out to the beach and that ended up being the intro to the movie. Uh, you know, with documentaries, you only get one take. So I thought that went really well, and I shot with them off and on for seven months. Uh, you know, they we went down to Oregon, and then we did a couple of film festivals together. Went out to Toronto, and then went to the big conference in in Raleigh, and it was a lot of fun. It, it was fun to it was fun to shoot, and I understood what was going to happen. The my community, the flat Earth community, was going to hate it, and the rest of everybody else was going to find it interesting. And I was right. You know, I sat in on a number of studio audiences you know, in, in sunglasses and a hat and, uh, and watch their reactions. Right. Like, yeah, exactly, exactly how it played out. And, uh, I, I don't regret a second. Would I have changed anything? No, no, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have changed the damn thing. So right. can I say damn in this class? Not a word. Oh, okay. Only I can. So, all right. All right. Let's see. Next question. Uh, let's see about the documentary. What, uh, is your, how is it? How's Patricia doing? What's she up to? What was y'all's relationship like in the documentary? Because I know in the documentary, you know, they kind of 
did you dirty in it but uh well it, like it, you're a simp for her but uh yeah and it was okay I, I honestly it wasn't that far from the truth she was oh absolutely she was an octave above me in mm -hmm. uh i mean she would have been the i mean she was she was the pretty girl in high school that never well you guys don't even do books anymore she never had to carry her books home ever <laughs> There were always guys waiting on her, always, always, always. And uh, it was flattering. I mean, she reached out to me because I was in the community and and she wanted to get to know me. So great. And we had a, a nice little relationship. But by the time we started filming the documentary, that relationship had had come and gone. So we kind of had to, you know, they wanted to shoot it to where it was more current and that there was, you know, sort of a, a, a triangle thing where she was going off to London to try to get married and it never happened. And uh, I, I get it. I, I see what they were doing. You know, they, they put me in the friend zone and I I didn't mind. I it's, you know, look, the narrative was what it was and it made people uh, more sympathetic to my character. So great. I'll take yeah. it. Yeah, we thought it was funny when they said, uh you know, we're a couple, a couple of friends. Oh, oh, that couldn't have been. And again, we didn't rehearse that or anything. We didn't rehearse anything, but that line was so well delivered. It was like, oh, I knew full well when we should, because that was at Patricia's house when, mm. when we did that in Houston. And she's still in Houston, by the way, uh, still doing her thing. She's not doing as much online content because, again, it's tougher for women to do online content. Uh, it's tough to be, uh, not only is she beautiful, she's rich. So, Yeah difficult for for her and they doxed her you know they they sent a wellness check to her house they sent pizzas to her house they sent cops to her house and uh she was like yeah that's it i'm taking a taking a break so, so she's, she, a, she's not really too involved no more no i but again she's invited to everything she didn't go to the vegas conference a couple weeks ago but uh you know she could she could always show up at any event everyone would know who she was and she'd be welcomed back with open arms not worried so what was your childhood like growing up? What anything cool you do or normal childhood or all that normal stuff? Uh no, my childhood was not normal <laughs> at all, as you can imagine. I mean, I grew up on an island, literally on an island up in the up in the northwest, uh, north of Seattle. Canada is literally right up the road from here. Uh, I lived in Canada for a year on top of that. Uh, and no, as a kid, I mean, yeah, I went to school and I played basketball and and uh, I windsurfed in my spare time and um, when I had extra spare time, I blew stuff up. I was a big pyro, big, big pyrotechnics guy. I loved chemistry, uh, and I was pretty good at it. And so, and, and because I lived on a beach, uh, as most people on an Island do, I uh, got to do a lot of firework shows and, and people paid me to do fireworks. And so I built them and tried to get myself in as much trouble as humanly possible. And, and did that for the most part, never did time. Just so you guys don't go to prison. It's really, really bad. I never did time, but I I just as well could have. So tell them the college story now. Oh God, uh, yeah. So uh, the fireworks thing kind of evolved. In fact, if you ever want to go to my channel, the very first Strange World podcast I did was called Fireworks because I wanted to have full disclosure and tell people. So if you want to listen to the two-hour version, have fun with that. It's actually a pretty good story. Turned it into a screenplay. Um, uh, made fireworks. the The Indian reservations up here, Native American reservations up here, uh, needed needed illegal fireworks. Uh, and wonder where they come from. They come from guys like me, who manufactured them in bulk. Uh, myself and thirty of my friends at Western University did them. Uh, we manufactured a whole ton of them. We flooded the market, and I got ratted out by a girl who my current girlfriend didn't like. So I fired her, and she wanted to get paid for work she hadn't done. And she said she would call the feds on me. And she did. I'll be damned if she didn't. She called the uh, FBI. She actually called the FBI on me. I was stunned, shocked, as a matter of fact. And uh, and so, yeah, they busted me. And uh, I was I was young. I was 20. Yeah, women. Am I right, Mark? Oh, my God. Go for Oh, by the way, yeah, men, just so you know. Yeah, men can say crap all day long, right? And just take it for a grain of salt. When a woman threatens you, do not ignore it. Never, never ignore it. <laughs> Yeah, women, I know. I have a wife. Women can hold a grudge. Oof, it was brutal. I know. Yeah. And and by the way, I didn't find out who it was for the longest time. And then some agent just, I go, how did you find me anyway? I asked the the ATF and they said, oh, yeah, this girl. Blah. And they described her. I'm going, I know exactly who that is. That's Lori. I, her name's not really Lori. Oh, okay. Maybe. Let's or it is. See. Uh, What other personal questions do we want to ask? What was it like when you went to NASA? 
Oh that. yeah, the 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 Kennedy Space Center, I believe. Was it Kennedy? I think it's Kennedy. The Houston Space Center. Um it it was okay. I mean, it's kind of like an aging amusement park. You know, you can tell that it was built a long time ago and everything's worn down. Uh and it was right after a a, a big rainstorm, so there weren't weren't a ton of people there. But um it was all right. I mean, you know, it was weird. They they didn't ban photography, but they did ban selfie sticks. It's one of the signs outside the door. Selfie sticks not allowed because apparently people with, with selfie sticks were just bumping into pe people constantly. So um, it was all right. I mean, it was it did it accomplish what we needed to. In fact, it wasn't even our idea. It was the, uh, uh, the directors. It's like, hey, let's do the Houston Space Center. It's like, all right, sure. Great. Wonderful. What about that scene where uh, they zoom in on the button when you're in the thing and you're saying none of this stuff works and uh, all that good stuff? It was a good gag, I admit. Uh, in fact, I, I let them keep it in the film. They asked me because uh, I, I did one of the initial screenings for it um, up in Toronto. And uh, what had happened was when you're shooting something, if you don't know, if you're doing any professional shooting, you leave the camera in that place as the whoever it is, the actor or actress leaves the screen so that way you have plenty of buffer room to to crop and edit and they realized when they were editing it's like you know we after he left we were focused on the green button it's like what if we just take out the part where mark actually hit the green button and we'll make him we'll make him look like he missed the obvious thing you know the only button in the whole place and i i saw exactly what they did it's like yeah it's a good it's a good bit i i like it you know it got you know it got good laughs at the uh at the thing and people were whispering about it it's like sure you know, I don't I don't mind. You know, I, I've told people I was like, look, during endorsements, you could tie me to a chair and throw pies at me. As long as the flat earth message gets out, it's totally fine. I, I will I will take it for the team. Are you on any uh flat earth dating sites that were mentioned in the uh show? Or have you ever been a part of any? No, and I know that you know the app, you know, the the David Weiss does um he's got a dating thing on that app. Uh, but I didn't really have to because 40%, at least that's, you know, from the meetups and the, uh, and the conferences we've done, 40% of our community is women. So we didn't have to, I mean, when I go to conferences, you know, meeting people was, was pretty easy. And yeah, since, well, since 2015, I've only dated flat earth women, but I never really had to uh, do a dating site or anything like that. I mean, you know, if you do enough, if you, if you put enough profile stuff out there, people will find you. Plus, I put all my contact information online, which I don't recommend for some people. Uh, but for me, it worked. So it's, I mean, again, I've, I've dated one, two, three. Two men five, to count, huh? Five, five, well, five or six. Uh, two from Canada and four from the States, I think. So, and But they've all been flat earth. No round earthers? You wouldn't date one? Can't. Can't. How how could we? Um, when and you and you know if you were in it. I mean, when you go to the conferences, for example, people can't sneak. You can't pretend to be a flat earther. We've never been fully infiltrated at a, at a conference. So like, uh, who's the guy that came to the Vegas conference? Uh, Tyler Oliveri. And we knew he was coming and we let him in and he tried to pretend to be one of us. And no, it's something about the eyes. When you're when you're talking to him, they don't they don't have the, the eyes and the, the, the vocabulary isn't the same. So, no, you, I can't date a, a global um, woman because it's it's almost like you're dating somebody from a different religion in fact it'd be easier to date somebody from a different religion than it would be to date somebody that's uh in a globalist for lack of a better term okay let's see what questions we want to ask you this class came up with lots of questions um by the way i like the shirt love the shirt yeah, I, I don't know. i don't see that shirt very often it's uh yeah, it's, it's a, a good one yep yeah do you, oh why do you wear the shirts in your documentary? I'll ask you that. Okay. All those shirts that are in the documentary were sent to me uh, by various people and you know, that came up with different things. Nothing's copyrighted basically, except for the app, the, uh, the nothing's copyrighted in flat earth. And so that particular shirt, I am Mark Sargent is just a variation off the old, um, I say old, uh, I was in the theater when I saw it. Uh, the 1999 movie fight club, brilliant movie. It is a takeoff on, I am Robert Paulson. Um, you know, we are all Robert Paulson and people, I don't know, I, I knew no who came up with the idea, the I am Mark Sargent thing, but it worked. It was like, yeah, sure. I mean, it was a fairly original shirt. And for the documentary, it seemed interesting enough that the producers are like, you know, because producers picked all that stuff. And they're like, yeah, yeah, let's let's go with that. So sure, that and that and my favorite is Flat Earth Army. But yeah. the I am Mark Sargent. Yeah, I'll take it. I caught some heat for it because if you don't understand it, 
you think that it's a it's an ego trip uh but for me it has a double meaning in that uh, I I don't use avatars and I don't use aliases when I'm online. So you know I'm I'm not Joe Cool five seventy seven or anything. I'm all, I'm always Mark Sargent when I'm online. So, okay. do you consider yourself famous or know anybody that's famous, or what's the most famous person you met? Oh wow. Uh, okay, that's a trick. Okay, there's three questions there. Uh, no, I don't really consider myself famous. It's more infamous than anything else. Uh, I was going to make a joke about how my rock star life, you know, all the all the drugs and the women and the the yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, sure, uh, sure. But uh, no, the the famous people. I mean, I've met a, a bunch of famous people. Um, boy, people that you guys would know though, because you're Gen Z. Um, the the most famous person flat earth the, as terms of you know career wise would have to be kelsey Grammer, uh you know from from frazier and cheers back in the day uh he was you know he played dr frazier crane uh he was he was really great but um my favorite athlete isn't kyrie irving even though kyrie's really really good you know from from basketball it'd be um novak Djokovic from tennis he's awesome and no one's ever going to beat him. He's going to go down as the greatest of all time. And uh, he's a flat earther. Oh yeah, he he hand drew a flat Earth map. He was clever. You see, he wasn't like Kyrie, where Kyrie comes out during a podcast during the All Star game. It's like, yeah, flat Earth. It's like, oh, that's so smart. No, that was a terrible idea. Um, uh, Novak just drew a picture of the of the flat Earth and ha and held it up. It was back in 2017. I've shown it to journalists, and they're like, I don't know what I'm looking at. I'm going, you would if you were one of us. And uh, so, no, but but yeah, there, I mean, there's other people out there. I mean, you can look it up. There's a media collection. It really depends what you're looking for. But I've got a media playlist on my channel with uh, people that have gotten into it. So you want you want infamous, the most infamous guy probably be Andrew Tate. Oh, yeah. He's, oh, yeah. He's not well liked. So no, no, he's not. <laughs> uh, did you meet him or you just know? Of no, him? no, 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 no. Anyone? No, I no. In, in fact, the the community is so broad i couldn't even meet a fraction of everyone that's out there uh however if uh if a andrew ever wanted to talk if he ever gets out of europe i I'd, I'd meet him sure okay. heck not uh, all press all press is good press don't let anyone tell you different yeah so what are your hobbies other than uh flat earth stuff what do you like to do oh well, before be before the whole pandemic thing, uh, I mean, I grew up, you know, basketball and windsurfing and and all that. But late lately, I don't know. I mean, hiking, love hiking, uh, love all things media. I, I've absorbed so many movies and so many television shows. I love sitting down with a big thing of popcorn. That's that's actually true from the documentary and just watching watching stuff. Uh, Patricia did and I did have that in common. I, I will say that. Um, other than that, I'm I'm a pretty laid back, easy guy. I'm not, and plus I'm older, so I'm not. I'm not doing rock climbing on a re regular basis, or ice climbing, or um, what is parkour or any of that crap. Okay. Uh, I guess last personal question, and then we'll go on to uh the flatter stuff. How's yeah. your mom doing? We all loved her. She was very sweet. Thank you. And mom is very sweet. Uh, she's doing. She's still doing great. Uh, she'll be turning eighty-one, and uh, wonderful woman. Uh, so lucky to have her. And again, I, again, they, they didn't really go into her backstory uh, during the during the documentary, but she was a career teacher. You know, uh, in fact, she 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 lucked out. She was mostly um, librarian and home ec for years and years and years. So uh, she got to it was neat because she ended her career, I think, at a, a primary school where she was basically telling kids stories. That was one of her specialties was uh, storytelling for kids. And it was awesome. Well, I guess last question, since I'm on about it, yeah. the show made it seem like you were living with mom during the time, were you? I was. I, it, I had just moved back. I had spent 20 years doing my own thing in Colorado. Uh, never got married, never had kids. And uh, I just, when True Television called me and one of the producers said, um, look, you got to, you got to get out of there. You got to go someplace. Basically, basically she, it, it wasn't an order, but she's like, look, you really should be with family right now because you're not going to be in one spot. You're going to be jumping all over the place. And so mom never got remarried. She was getting older and it's like, yeah, you know what? We, we've always gotten along. So great. Wonderful. Came home and that's where we uh, we shot part of the documentary. Although that little house in the first part, little here's a story I haven't told you. Little house where where mom's walking out of in the um, the documentary. That's my sister's house, <laughs> and we didn't tell my sister <laughs> that we had shot there. 
and we never told her it's like well it's not like the movie's gonna come out or anything then it comes out on netflix and people were calling my sister it's like oh your house looks so cute in the documentary and my sister's like what documentary and she is not one of us and so oh my god she lost it absolutely freaking lost it <laughs> all right so we'll get on to the flat earth questions now so okay. i'll write this down his responses so how does she how does she get a laptop and nobody else gets a laptop she's so charging why, why are her you phone. So, what she's charging her phone Oh. She's charging her phone with it. All right. They're not using it for useful information. All right. What makes you so special? I was just wondering. It's like everybody else. It's like <laughs> peer pressure. That's right. Be embarrassed. That's right. <laughs> All right. So first flat earth question is this. Is there an ice wall? Has anyone ever seen it? All that good stuff. Uh, okay. The ice wall is not what you think it is. It is not a Game of Thrones uh, ice wall that uh, you know from from the television series. the The ice wall that people talk about, and I know the media likes making fun of it. That's just the coastline of Antarctica. So when you go to Antarctica, most of the coastline is ocean, 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 and then you get to just basically a wall of ice. It's like 150 feet high, but then it goes inland for a long, long way. A lot of people don't know this about Antarctica. Uh, most of the continent sits at about 14,000 feet. And that's what science will tell you, which is amazing. I mean, altitude sickness kicks in at half that at like 7,000 feet. So, yes, there is a huge amount of ice uh, in Antarctica. But no, the, the ice wall they talk about is not the barrier. The barrier would be a long way in. And the United States government uh, was looking for it from the late 20s all the way up until almost 1960. And then when they figured out, that's when the Antarctic Treaty was put in, which you guys probably may or may not know about. And they locked down Antarctica basically from almost everybody forever. There you go. Oh, wait, what was the, what was the initial question? Uh, what is, is the ice one? wall? <laughs> is there one? Oh, no, no, hey. no, no. The ice, no, the ice wall is not what you think it is. Sorry, I, I keep forgetting you guys have test questions on this. All right. That's the so that's the, the short answer. One. It is no, it is not what you think it is. Okay. So the next one is at the documentary at the very <laughs> end, you know, they did the light test right. and all that. You know, that's how it ended. Sure. And can you explain the results? Oh, okay. That uh, also was the power of editing. Okay, <laughs> so that was Jaron, one of our guys from a, a YouTube channel called Jaronism, and he uh, in his defense. He had ticked off the director because he had brought him up the first time. You know, they flew up from Los Angeles. And this thing was done on a shoestring budget. I mean, they were maxing out credit cards. And I think they still had to bring in another executive producer for this. So they flew up to San Francisco to shoot the first time. And Jaron melted the laser, right? Which you probably saw in the documentary. And then they brought him up a second time because Jaron's like, no, no, I totally got this now. They came back up a second time. And the test seemed to show that the, you, you had to raise it up to, to see. And we're going, what What did you do wrong? We've done this test so many times over so many different things. I mean, we did it over a frozen lake in um, Hungary. It was 40 miles long. We almost like lost two people from frostbite to, to do it. And um, and so Jaron goes out during the middle of the day, a short time later, and he said, um, and he goes, goes out to that place in the day. He goes, wow, I've never seen it in the daytime. It's like, what? What are you talking about? You didn't do a dry run. Turns out it wasn't actually flat at all. It, it had these, and he goes, well, Google Maps says it's kind of flat. And it's like, dude, you never, just so you guys know, if you're doing production stuff, never do it live the first time, ever, ever, ever. Always do a dry run. Always know what you're doing. So short version is, um, it, it wasn't, the the test was going to be invalid anyway, because it wasn't a completely flat surface. You should have gone to an airport runway or whatever it was, or salt flats. Uh, but he also shouldn't have uh, called the producers up to to do it twice like that. So I'm sorry, the short answer was the results were inconclusive. How's that? Is that, good. Is that a good enough answer? That's perfect. I need all that work. Okay. So offense you can, Dylan. It's all good. You can help them. We'll help them if you can. But next question. Yeah. How do eclipses work with flat earth? Uh eclipses. Okay, so if you're for your test answer. The eclipses are just the projections on a ceiling. So you are in a building and everything that you see above you, the lights, the stars, the eclipses, the moon, the sun, uh, everything is just just images. It's just part of a giant ornamental clock system that predates language. That's all it is. So when you see a waxing and waning crescent in a planetarium, how do we do it? We just shade the moon. That's all we do. 
who's to say when you don't walk out of a planetarium, you're just not in a much bigger soundstage, which is what we say. Uh, Shakespeare, all the world's a stage. Has anyone ever tried to find the edge of flat earth? Yes. Yeah. The American government did. Um, in fact, uh, more specifically, uh, OK, so the short answer, your test answer would be the American cover government did. And if you want bonus points, if you guys get bonus points, would be uh, Admiral Byrd for the United States. He was the youngest admiral in the United States Navy, and he looked for it. He looked for it from he basically flew planes as planes were getting better and better and finally turned into pressurized aircraft. Uh, from 1927 all the way up to his last mission was Operation Deep Freeze in 1955 to 1956. And that's when we think he found it. You know, he he flew again. If you fly in a circles and bigger circles for 30 years, you better be able to find something. I think they almost gave up in 1954 when he went on uh, television and was basically saying that the whole place is made out of money and all the countries are going to start fighting over resources. And the very next mission, they came back and it's like, yeah, we're going to lock this place down forever. <laughs> It's like it's the only bro unbroken treaty in the history of treaties, just so you know. Treaties were meant to be broken, except for that one. And it's not even up for review until 2041, which doesn't seem that long from now, but it was a hell of a long way from uh, uh, 1960. So how do seasons work with flat earth, like fall, winter, spring, sure. summer? Sure. All that uh, stuff. OK, so uh, I got to give you a short test answer on that. So if you are living in a big snow globe, uh, the seasons work because the sun and the moon, we'll just use the sun. The sun is very, very small and travels over the world like a needle on a record player. There you go. There's your analogy. Meaning a needle on a record player. Do you guys even know what a record player is? It's yeah. a, okay, yeah. good. Yeah, one guy. Great. So, so a needle, uh, a needle on a record player, as the as it progresses through the song, the, the needle moves uh, in towards the center. And if you reverse it, it, you know, it goes out. And so the sun, if it is only 50, 70 miles wide, uh, just travels in and out, you know, and uh, in, and while it changes the path every time, uh, it helps with the seasons. Of course, and this part isn't on the test. So needle and record player thing, that's for your test. But the other part would be uh, the sun, being that it's so, so small, wouldn't also have enough energy to affect the seasons entirely. You could also rely on the uh, the jet stream, which is the upper uh, air system, and more importantly, the uh, underwater conveyor system, which transfers huge amounts of energy through the oceans. Uh, you know, the oceans have uh, big, big currents. If those if those things ever shut down or, or were disrupted, oh, we'd have massive, massive problems. And those systems work just fine on a on a flat snow globe Earth. Okay. Well, the next two questions I'll kind of group together because they kind of fall under the same category. But sure. Uh, why? Yeah. Let me word this. Why is NASA hiding this information from us? And what would you have to gain? Like, and then right. like the next part. Other question was like, how do you explain pictures of round Earth? I'm sure you just say like. Okay. Well, let's Earth. let's do the let's do the pictures first. Is the is the pictures part on the on the test? It's, well, I'm not giving them a test, but oh, okay. it's a, this is a no, what this is a test grade, yes. Okay, so we'll do the pictures first. So everything, every image that you see from NASA, everything from every space agency has been faked since minute one. Uh, going all the way back to Apollo, hell, going. Sorry, am I even supposed to say hell? Doesn't really matter. Going all the way back to Gemini. Uh, you know, they started out with very simple. I mean, heck, they used stop motion uh, for for some of the early stuff. Apollo is just. A, a, I'm unfortunate because the people that took the pictures on the Apollo landing, the, the really glossy, beautiful pictures, not the video, um, you could tell those were professional cameramen that did not know physics and how light works. And they brought multiple studio lights. It's like, dude, we caught that in like two seconds. Um, every All the pictures of the Earth? No. I mean, there's a reason. I'll, in fact, I'll give you a, a short one. Ready? The first blue marble, you can look this up. First blue marble shot of the Earth was uh, Apollo 17, 1972. Right. You can look that up all day long. It shows the bottom part of Africa and all of Antarctica, which is really weird for a North American space program. You'd think they take a shot of America. Right. But the blue first blue marble shot was 1972. You know when the second blue marble shot was summer of 2015 when we started coming out 43 years and they didn't take a second blue marble shot. And we knew this because Obama was the one that told people about it. And uh, Scott Kelly, astronaut, uh, wrote the press press briefing for it. 
And it's like, why, why it took you so long? It's because they're te absolutely terrified of uh, faking it. And if you also, sorry, if you want to look up one more thing, look up the black marble shots of, of, of earth, which were brilliant because like they showed all these cities, but the people, again, you don't have photographers do stuff without engineers helping you. So they showed all these cities, for example, on the West side of Australia, there are no cities on the West side of Australia, but it showed it like there's these ma massive population centers. It's like, what the heck? And they, they're saying, oh, well, there were forest fires that summer. It's like, really? On, on the coastline of, of Australia? Whatever. So, um, but to your first point, the uh, why why would NASA keep it a secret, right? Yeah, what did they have to gain from it, all that stuff? Sure. Um, it's not even that the NASA kept the secret. NASA was built to keep the secret. NASA was built right as the Antarctic Treaty was being uh, was being done. In fact, the the Antarctic Treaty, which was Antarctic Treaty, which was ratified in 1959, was um, NASA was was already doing their was doing their first space shots. NASA announced the Van Allen radiation belts that said you should not ever do space travel the same year that the Antarctic Treaty was done. Why do you keep it a secret? Because you're worried about what the public will do. Unfortunately, it was just bad. It came down to bad timing. Which was, you know, by 1960, the our civilization had been built, all the infrastructure had been built. You run into the risk of huge problems if you tell people in 1960. I mean, academically, all the university was the libraries have to be redone. Economically, you'd have to shut down world markets, and of course, the five major religions of the world: Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. You're giving them leverage against science simultaneously? No, nah. no, you can't do it. Can't do it. In fact, I wouldn't do it either. I've, I've talked to a number of journalists and I've said, would you in 1960 have told the public that this was the truth? You tell, oh, yeah, by the way, you're not living in this cosmos that we've been describing for decades. You're actually living in a snow globe. It's too dangerous. And so they've been ever since then, they've been trying to find a way to uh, introduce it into the public. And it's been slow going, but recently it's caught on. Okay. Are other planets flat? Or no. do they exist in the first place? No, other planets are just lights on the ceiling. That's all they are. Uh, no different than again, if you go to a planetarium and you look up and say, "Hey, look, that's Saturn up on the up on the ceiling." Yeah, great. Does it look spherical? Yeah, because it's a good planetarium. Can you land on it? Nope. Why not? Because it's just lights on the ceiling. You are in a building with walls and a floor and a ceiling. You're in a soundstage that was uh, built by someone or some things that are way older and more powerful than ourselves. In fact, if you want to look up a movie reference to something like this, look up the movie Contact, which I know is a space movie with Jodie Foster. Well worth it. What's underneath Flat Earth, if anything? Pie. Pumpkin pie is underneath us. No, it is not. Uh, do not write that down. I saw somebody, you were going to write that down, weren't you? No, no, don't do it. Just because I said it doesn't mean it's, it's true, by the way. Uh, no, we don't know what's underneath it because science can't tell you what's underneath the earth. Meaning, uh, you know, they say it's 4,000 miles to the center of the earth, right? The deepest hole ever drilled is not 2,000, it's not 1,000, it's not 100, it's not even 10 miles. Uh, the Russians and the Germans tried for years. They can only get down to, what, 7.8 miles. And then the drill bit stopped working. And, and these were in completely different locations. They could not get past it. They tried for years to do it. So, and yet we, you know, you can open up, up any science book and it'll show you the exact cross section of what earth looks like. However, you go to Wikipedia and look in the fine print. It's pretty funny because they'll say, yeah, we have no idea what's down there. We're just extrapolating from volcanoes. It's like, okay, all right. So why are you showing us this? Or why don't you, why don't you put the small print in in the the maps is because that's not what they do yes yeah, science should put just the earth with a big question mark in the center of it but that's not what they do they take their best guess and science would love them i hate them it's like this is what it is until it's wrong and then it's like well that's what it was now this is what it is they never apologize for anything bugs me so next question yeah uh how does the sun generate heat if it's a if it's just a light in the sky or does it generate oh no it generates heat uh, it absolutely generates heat. Uh, the the sun is basically look up a you guys want to look up a really funky guy who's got a really interesting take on this. Is he's not one of our guys. Um, look up a guy named um, Eric Dollard, D O L L A R D. He's really really good. But he was basically saying that the the sun is an incandescent light bulb, and uh, and the moon is is its own light. What what his point was is like well if it's an incandescent light bulb, where's the power coming from? He goes, because it's not fusion. He goes, I he goes, I don't know what's happening in the sun, but he goes, that sun is being lit by something else. I thought that was fascinating. But so the, the sun is generating heat. Yes, it absolutely is. 
However, the, the more interesting thing, you can look this up um, uh, on at least in our stuff, mainstream science won't touch it, which is why is the moon generating a cold laser light on its own? A cool laser light, which we can do in universities and health products all day long. We've been able to do it for years, meaning it's cooler in the moonlight than the moonshade, which is the opposite from the sun. The sun, you know, it's it's cooler in the shade than than under sunlight. In fact, if you magnify moonlight, it even gets colder. As a, how how is that possible? Does that mean that we're living in some sort of big snow globey thing? Not necessarily, but it destroys the relationship between the sun and the moon. Because remember, the moon is supposedly only lit because it's reflecting the sunlight. Nope, it is its own light source. Okay, next question. Yeah. Would you go to space if offered? <laughs> and if so, if you saw the Earth was round, what would you do? Yes, I would go to space. Uh, I have been offered on a number of occasions, but the the deals just fell through. Uh, I don't know, the British were always big on getting me to go. I don't know what it is. You know, they never really had a space program. Um, but they they're they're never gonna let me go because because again it's not real we we know it's been faked for a long time but they will make you sign the waivers they will make you sign the disclosure forms. But uh, if you were to go and saw the Earth was round, what if, would happen? If I if I went, in fact, okay, if I went and I saw the Earth was round and they didn't do some you know fakery like you know put me in a blindfolded bus and then all this, but in fact. Uh, I would quit tomorrow. However, if you want to look up the reason why I'd be suspicious, unless they actually had me watching every st step of the way, look up a British television show that was done a few years ago called Space Cadets, where they got it was a reality show where they fooled people into a fake space, fake British space program, put them in a simulator and convinced them that they were in orbit. And it was one of the most heartbreaking things ever because then they came down from orbit apparently, right, really, really fast, and they wheeled the uh, the capsule into a into a studio audience, into an auditorium, and the people got out, you know, with the smoke and everything. They realized they never were never in space at all. Imagine that going through this whole thing for weeks and weeks and weeks, and it's, oh yeah, by the way, it was a reality show. You didn't go anywhere. Well, I think that was the last question because. You know, they have four minutes left on the time oh, okay. because I'm poor and don't want to buy the expensive version of Zoom. So got it. So thank you for answering all of our questions and taking time out of your day to be with us. Thank we you. love talking to you. We loved uh, the documentary and we loved your <laughs> questions you had to answer for us. What I'm sorry. What What's the I, I can't see it really well. What's the I, we love you. I love March Sargent. Hey, hey, love it. Number one, oh, it's number one fan. That's what oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Don't know if you're absolutely serious, but love the enthusiasm. No, I don't think they're that serious, but uh, <laughs> good stuff. No, th no, thank you guys, and 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 thank you by the way for uh for showing them the documentary and and opening it to questions and wearing one of the coolest t shirts ever. Yeah, it is pretty cool. Get a dime for it. And uh, it was it was great. So thanks, guys. Well, thank you, Mark. Next year, I'm inviting you back. I promise. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. You too, Mark. See ya. Bye. <laughs> Bye.